Let me begin by asking both of you, how much difference do you think contact tracing technologies will be able to change the way public health crisis is being handled? Uh, Professor Salate, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I mean, we know that from many other diseases as well, but I think COVID in particular also has shown us that we need to really be one step ahead. As you know, one of the challenges with this virus is that people can be contagious before they actually feel symptomatic. And so that's why it's so important to, to get to these contacts before they get sick. So it's, it's critical. Contact tracing um, should, though, be supported, we think, by digital tools because of the speed of this issue. And digital tools can really help us to speed up the process. Mm. Mm. Uh, Dr. Zheng Yi, you've been doing research about that in China. For example, a latest survey uh, about the relations between facial recognition and contact tracing. Uh, what are some of the results you find? Uh, how is it likely to help us understand this important question? Um, I think maybe I want to talk about contact tracing first. I think what is kind of uh, uh, emerging uh, technology is that now we're having the digital uh, contact tracing supported by uh, many of the t technologies such as uh, Bluetooth, uh, mobile station, and, and also uh, many other uh, ways that you can actually help w in which way people are connecting to each other. I think uh, these are the uh, IT infrastructure that can uh, support us, um, but uh, we should be really uh, care about whether these are really effective well, on the other hand, there are many mm. people who are not really using this kind of mobile. Well, in this case, how can we take care of this kind of people well, with leaving no one behind? That's something we, we have to concern. Um, mm. And also, uh, just now you mentioned that recently we published a report on facial recognition and public health, uh, which my, myself learned a lot well, because uh, our uh, uh, respondents are, uh, are actually uh, all, Ch all Chinese all over the world of, or Chinese users. Uh, what they found uh, during uh, this survey is that uh, although now we're having this kind of a, a public uh, uh, health crisis, but, but actually what people okay. think is, it's not really that you can have technology um, that can help us, but, but you cannot really go too much uh, to actually have mm -hmm. access to my uh, private data. We're not really, right. we're, we can actually show some of our uh, uh, convenience to say that, uh, okay, I can move in a little bit forward, uh, but if you go to my private data, even within this period of time, people are not really uh, happy with that. Let me ask you, uh, Professor Salate, if I can, you argue that, that much of the information being collected now in the contact tracing practice since the COVID-19 broke out are not necessarily useful. In other words, they do not necessarily need to be collected. We need to collect the data smartly to help with the campaign against COVID-19. What exactly are some of data not helpful? What have been some of the data that do not need to be collected? And what should be some of the data that urgently need to be collected? Yeah, so that, that's a very difficult question because oftentimes, especially in a crisis, it's, it's very hard to very clearly say from the beginning, this data does not need to be collected and this data needs to be collected. And that's, mm. that difficulty, of course, also opens the door to say, well, let's just collect everything and then we later figure out uh, what was useful. And from an epidemiological perspective, I mean, I'm an epidemiologist, I have, you know, deep understanding for that. But I think this is exactly where we have to find the trade-off. And, mm. you know, for me, the important thing about contact tracing, I mean, what it really does, if you think about it, is it, tr it tries to trace transmissions, and maybe we should actually rename it to something like transmission tracing or something like that. And so there, well, the one thing that we need to know is, was there a potential transmission chain? And so I think a lot of things um, about that, you know, when you think about location, it could be maybe useful information, but really for contact tracing, we here think that this is, for example, not important information. It's just what you need to know is, was there a contact between two people where the disease could be transmitted? The where, for example, 
is not important from an epidemiological perspective. And so we would like to keep this out of the digital contact tracing. And it helps people also build more trust that they don't feel that they are completely surveyed um, by mm. location tracking as an example. But there are many other examples like that. Mm. Dr. Zhang, what about the situation in China and in, uh, let's just say, Northeast Asia? As uh, culturally speaking, there seems to be more tendency here to uh, react to the government's call, uh, work with the authorities. Uh, uh, what have you found out since the breaking, all, breaking out of the pandemic uh, and how people now looking at what should be the data collected besides their attitude about whether their data should be collected or not at all? Right. I think uh, basically um, there, are two, there are two approach for contact tracing uh, where mm -hmm. I, I think in Europe and, and in America and people go for like using uh, Bluetooth technology where ignoring who you are, I mean uh, your, your contact details I would say, uh, name, ID, uh, but, but in China, uh, actually, our health code uh, does collect this kind of information. I, I think that's uh, for the reason to, to make sure this is exactly that you are using this kind of uh, are using this uh, mobile. But in China, there are uh, some of the information I would say that I don't see clear um, a, a clear reason why we're having this. Let's say that uh, when you have are having the health code, then uh, maybe sometimes they, they're asking to take a picture for you for now. Or in this case, I, I think this kind of facial data are not quite necessary. Although I know the mm. motivation is, is that they want to uh, verify this is exactly you. Um, but I don't see too much reason why that's really important uh, if you're right. a healthy person. Um, uh, with your, I think with your mobile number, uh, they, they can identify this is uh, uh, the, used, the useful information from you. So uh, like you said, some of the information may not be necessary for this one. But I think on the, on the other hand, as long as the government uh, or the supplier, technology suppliers uh, supported by the government that can secure this kind of uh, uh, data, uh, the risk is a little bit lower, uh, but just make sure mm. they, they could secure this kind of data. How can we make efforts to make sure that data are being collected exactly for public health use and will not be misused? Uh, this, uh, I think, is more crucial a question that really needs to be answered. Uh, Professor Salate. Yes, no, it's, it's a really an excellent question and is really at the core of this debate. Um, I think, I mean, there's there's two, I think, ways to approach this. One is to say, let us build technology that um, draws a line in the sand, right? Where you say, um, this technology can actually not be misused. I mean, this is, of course, generally quite hard, but there are things you can do, right? That you can build into the technology, something, you know, that is called privacy by design where you know, okay, this could not be uh, easily at least misused for, for this technology. And this is, for example, these ideas with decentralized contact tracing where all the information stays on the device. And this is also mm -hmm. now what you know, Apple and Google are releasing with their um, COVID contact tracing API. So that's one thing. But then the other thing I think is more on the political level where you know, even if you try to build the most privacy preserving technology, I mean, there's ways um, that this can eventually be used for other purposes, that the data can be stored for longer and so on. I think there you have to come to a political agreement with all the, with all the actors involved and say, you know, let's, let's come to an agreement of how we use this. In Europe, it seems that there's a, there's a common agreement that this data will be very rapidly deleted as, you know, after mm. 21 days or so, it really is not very useful anymore, epidemiologically speaking. But there, I think every country, of course, has to come to its own decisions about how to do that. Now, uh, it is not the first time or the second that we have heard that our information has been used, not necessarily to our advantage, by the private sector these two gigantic tech companies included. Uh, our data in their hands will become a great source of income for the future. So 
what do you think about the responsibilities of these private sector players? Have they been observing their ethics? Uh, how can we make sure they are going to, at least for this time? Yeah, um, I mean, I think as as always, um, ultimately these these companies, just like every other actor, right, in in the private sector, um, has to also be held accountable to to standards that are actually relevant even outside of a crisis. But I think also particular during the times of a crisis. Um, I mean, I've been mostly following the uh, discussion around Apple and Google for the simple reason that they together control, you know, 99% plus of the of the phone, smartphone market um, in terms of operating system. And since we are interested mostly in doing digital contact tracing with with smartphones, that's that's where the game uh, plays out. And there i've been quite pleased i have to say i mean i am someone who's who's ready to criticize both apple and google if i see you know <laughs> issues with privacy but i've been quite pleased <laughs> with how they came on board with mm -hmm. um with a decentral model that really says the data stays on your device of course you, you can mm -hmm. argue well then you have to trust apple and google that the data stays on your device but that, that's true for everything right every email you write every photo you take um, so I've been generally quite pleased with, with the response there, but we have to make sure we, of course, keep them accountable and check that yeah. this is really what happens. Mm. Dr. Zhang? I think um, in, in China, we have some ways of stop the communication with those IT companies. That when, when they are doing some, uh, when they are having some behavior, which is not what we expected, uh, the mechanism in here is, is that for some of the ministry, let's say for Ministry of Indus, Industry and Information Technology, they'll have kind of a nice tea with those guys and say, this mm -hmm. is something that uh, people don't really want. So maybe you need some change. So you don't really have, have, a, have a hard law saying that you're against that. By, by using this kind of a softer principles, actually, for those IT companies, they, they're, they're kind of effective mechanisms uh, for them. And I would say mm. for, for now, uh, for those AI companies, giant AI companies in, in China, uh, they, they started to have their own AI governance institute and also uh, AI ethical principles are put in mind or even in their product. Uh, so yeah. uh, in, in this case, I, I'm kind of positive. But on the other side, uh, as far as I know, uh, that uh, for those services that are provided by these kind of companies, actually the data actually hold by the by the government, uh, and the IT mm. company claim that they do not really hold this kind of data uh, as long as we can trust them. So we need to, from the government side, uh, we need to make sure that uh, they are not really holding this data. And from the uh, and from the government itself uh, side, uh, we should have. Uh, the, the security um, system that really secure this kind of uh, data and do not distribute right. to irrelevant people. Uh, fascinating discussion. My final point, of course, we talk about you know the relations between the private sector and the individuals, the government individuals, private sector and the government. But there's one thing that we really need to ask now. We want to go back to normalcy or at least partial normalcy. That's why contact tracing is extremely important. But that also means international cooperation because if you want to travel from one country to another, that means your contact tracing uh, mechanism have to work and it has to be trusted by different governments, different countries and different peoples. How does that work? Um, uh, Professor Salate, I know a little bit about Switzerland. Now, you have a lot of, uh, uh, for example, Italian citizens that are working in Switzerland. Uh, meanwhile, Dr. Zeng, uh, Chinese are traveling around the world uh, because China is open up, China is dealing with the rest of the world in such an intense way. So how can we create this kind of international cooperation that, so that contact tracing can serve all of us? Yeah, this, this is an excellent question. Um, this is something, you know, as you can imagine, right, as, as a Swiss, um, and as, you know, the Swiss have asked themselves this question very, very early on, basically from day one, because we, we are a small country. We're in the middle of Europe. So basically, right, you're, you're, you're outside to the Swiss borders very quickly. So for us, um, 
international travel, international commerce, international cooperation is incredibly important. So any system you know that that we use here um, should work with other systems. Now, I think there has been a lot of debate about how this should work. With respect to contact tracing, I think the fact that there is now a coherent principle that's basically implemented on the operating systems that will make this discussion a little bit easier. It doesn't mean it's going to be a very easy discussion. We really have to you know, figure this out in great detail. But ultimately, if we all um, agree to the same principle, which I think we now will also given um, this implementation on the phones, it, is, it, it will be much, much easier to do this on an international level. I mean, at the end of the day, of course, every country will have to decide how they do it. But I think technically it's now becomes substantially easier now that we all agree on this decentralized model and i hope mm. uh, that will be adopted by many countries um, very rapidly and then it should be relatively easy to do this uh, cr across borders i see uh, dr zhang different story or a similar story i think um, for international collaboration uh, for, uh, for for shared um, healthcare systems is really um, essential I, I see the future is like this i, I think what can be learned uh, from both sides is, is that for uh, proximity and contact tracing in Europe, um, that is really privacy preserving. But there are some problems when, when you actually, when, let's say, when you go to China, and then uh, it's not quite sure that the, the mobile phone you're using actually from you. So in this case, actually, the, how can you identify mm. this is really your um, cell phone? Uh, but from the Chinese side, when, when, the, when the Chinese government um, need to share this data, let's say, to Europe, and then we have an ID in our household. So in this case, if you're safe, a uh, house perspective safe uh, from China, then this kind of uh, information is actually associated with your passport in this case. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of confirmed that this kind of uh, data is trustworthy, at least in China. So actually, the Chinese mm. government is, is using it. Uh, if you if you like it, you can use it. So uh, <laughs> if you, we're really uh, making the bridge. We need to uh, find a way to to, to link um, the, to link right. what we have from both sides. Uh, I see this is challenging, uh, but I think mm. uh, if we really want a, a, a world of a, health, a healthy world, uh, and we need to share this data, the, the connection has to. Be there's data security, there's uh, uh, different players, uh, their responsibilities, there's geopolitics, there is the pandemic vis-a-vis -vis contact tracing, so many complicated stories in one. I want to thank both of you for sharing your insights, helping us to understand much better about the latest situation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Okay. Zeng Yi from China and the Professor Marcel Salate from Switzerland. Really appreciate it. Thank you.